So, okay, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Dima Devaris, Chief of Pathology at Grand River Hospital and uh, St. Mary's General Hospital and the Regional Clinical Lead for Cancer Care Ontario. On behalf of Cancer Care Ontario, the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, the Canadian Association of Pathologists, I would like to welcome everyone to today's CAP Checklist Education Session on the Lung and Lung Biomarker. Before I introduce our speaker and we formally get away, I'd like to take care of a few housekeeping items. The set being recorded and will be made available to all participants via email links when recordings become available. Both live and recorded presentations are eligible for CME credits. The information for obtaining credits was provided in notice for this in previously distributed. These no CME certificates for each of the CAP checklist education sessions will only issue one month from the presentation date. Please to the session notice for the exact deadline and date. Note that everyone's line has been automatically muted for today's presentation. The number of participants, so we cannot troubleshoot any WebEx issues as part of this call. If you're having difficulties, please call the WebEx support line at at one eight six six two 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 nine three three nine. I'll read that one eight six six two nine two three nine. We encourage you to submit questions at any time during the presentation using the chat feature. The documentation previously uh, the documentation was previously distributed by the instructions for using the WebEx chat window. Duration and answer portion of the presentation, in order to avoid question collisions, a staff member will pose the submitted questions on your behalf as long as time permits the order in which they appear. So in that window, please include the following information. Your institution's name, the individual posing the question, and the question. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. David Huang. Uh, David is a pulmonary pathologist at the University Health Network and associate professor in the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at the University of Toronto. He is a of the MD-PhD program at the University of Toronto, and David completed his residency in anatomical pathology at the University of Toronto, during which time he trained in pulmonary pathology with Dr. D. Chamberlain at the Toronto General Hospital and to Samuel Yusuf, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. His interests include both neoplastic and neoplastic lung diseases. He co-authored over 70 peer-reviewed publications. He has operating grant funding from the National Sanitarium Association and is an investigator in several CHIR teams. Dr. currently serves in various lung Relating groups for Cancer Care Ontario and the chair of the Lung Expert Review Panel for the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer. So, without much further ado, I introduce Dr. Hwang to give today's talk on the lung and lung biomarker cap cancer checklist. Dr. Devaris, um, I think I share my desktop. Okay, thank you. So thank you for the opportunity to come and speak um, about the CAP cancer checklists for lung and lung biomarker. So the next, uh, I guess we get into that, uh, just in terms of disclosures, I have received some uh, committees and speakers uh, on our area from Pfizer uh, over the past uh, couple of years, and I will not disclose uh, any off or discuss any off-label use or investigational use in my presentation. Uh, sorry, Dr. Wong, it's uh, Dana speaking. Um, I gave you the, inf uh, the center information, so if you want to share your screen, um, oh. you should be able to now. Okay. There we go. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So, um, 
over the next hour or so, I'd like to uh, quick run through the CAP answer checklist, uh, realizing the changes that have been made in the most recent uh, iteration. Uh, I'll give a brief review of some of the targetable molecular alterations that occur in lung cancers. And uh, following that, a uh, quick review of the CAP lung biomarker checklist. So lung cancer um, is one of the leading causes of death worldwide. Uh, in 2002, it was estimated to be uh, the number nine killer of all uh, different causes of death worldwide. And over the next 15 years or so, it's expected to increase to the number uh, position. Certainly, while the incidence of lung cancer has been declining in the Western world for some years now, it still remains a significant cause of disease and, and mortality. In Canada, as you can see from this figure, the number of estimated new cases of lung cancer uh, in Canada in 2009 was roughly equivalent to the number of breast prostate or colorectal uh, cancers. However, when you look in the estimated deaths column, uh, it's estimated that the number of deaths uh, due to lung cancer exceeds the number of deaths from these other three cancers uh, combined. Now, the prognosis and treatment of, of lung cancer really is based primarily on uh, two elements, that being tumor stage and histologic type. Go into more detail in this later in the presentation, but historically, lung cancer has been divided based on two clinical divisions, namely small cell lung cancer and non small cell lung cancer. On this division, there, there really was not uh, much in the way of uh, uh, anything of clinical relevance. However, especially over the past decade, though, the implications of different subtypes within the non small cell lung cancer category are being increasingly recognized, and uh, we'll talk about these uh, later on. As related to that, more recently, the presence or absence of molecular alterations associated with this sensitivity to specific targeted therapies um, has really been um, recognized, and as a result of that, there's been increasing emphasis placed on testing for these molecular alterations. So basically, the tumor stage and histologic type and these molecular alterations, these are the, really the basis for the CAP lung and lung biomarker checklists, which I'll uh, talk about now. The current lung protocol is version 3.3, and this was revised in October 2013. Just a quick overview of the revisions. Uh, that made a few months ago. Uh, the divisions were actually fairly minor. The most major one was uh, a change to the histologic types that are listed in the uh, call, uh, specifically having to do with the uh, adenocarcinoma subtypes. These changes really reflect an update to the classification based on the 2011 ILC, ATS, and ERS classification uh, published in the journal of Thoracic Oncology. And adenocarcinoma uh, displaces uh, the WHO 2004 classification on which the uh, checklist was previously based. Other regions include uh, addition of main stem bronchus to the tumor site, um, changes uh, to the histologic grade specifically. Uh, histologic grade is no longer a required element, but has been changed to an optional element. And some of the explanatory notes for both histologic type and grade have been updated. Other minor revisions uh, to the list, uh, margins section, uh, two of the previous entries, namely pro-pleural margin and chest wall margin, have been deleted and just subsumed under other attached tissue margin. Additional sub-elements were added to vascular invasion uh, and some changes to treatment effect and, uh, and three studies. Uh, that section has been deleted and reference has been made instead to the CT lung biomarker template. 
run through the checklist uh, quickly. Uh, the checklist begins with information regarding the resection specimen itself and regarding the tumor. Um, there have been no changes to the specimen type, uh, the procedure, specimen entity, or specimen later laterality elements. Uh, so as you can see, it starts with uh, the specimen type, be it uh, a lung or a lobe or bronchial resection, followed by the procedure type. Really the major type of procedures for lung cancer would be probably either wedge resections or lobectomies, but there are other specimens that, that may be used as well. So integrity is a field that's meant to, uh, I guess, put some explanation if uh, there are there be elements that may not be interpretable. Uh, for instance, margin status and the, the sub here are intact, disrupted, or indeterminate. Most time, uh, uh, specimens that will be received intact, uh, although occasion they may be fragmented for whatever reason, either due to the presence of adhesions. Or more commonly, there may be staple line tears, and uh, sometimes uh, tumors may be difficult to assess in terms of, um, I guess, the plural status because there's been a tear right over the uh, area where the tumor approaches the visceral pleura. So this is something that can be uh, indicated in this field. Spinaterality, as I said, this has not changed. And there are a number of uh, elements that deal with the tumor itself. So the tumor site, uh, which fits in, as I mentioned previously, main stem bronchus has been added to this uh, tumor site field. Uh, tumor size has not changed. Tumor focality has not changed, but I, I would like to make a note about this because probably more than any other uh, quote that we receive in consultation here at UHN, it has to do with uh, the distinction between separate tumor nodules whether in the same lobe or a different lobe, or uh, versus synchronous primaries. This certainly can be uh, a very challenging uh, question. Um, I would just draw your attention to an article in the uh, HSP uh, several years ago uh, relating how comprehensive histologic assessment may be helpful in these situations, specifically uh, comparing uh, primary histologic pattern, secondary histologic pattern, and uh, maybe some normal characteristics and nuclear grade uh, between tumors. So I would draw your attention to that article if uh, this is an issue that you struggle with. Uh, moving uh, through the other tumor characteristics, uh, histologic type uh, elements have changed, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but small cell carcinoma and squamous cell Carcinoma elements uh, have not changed, and you can see them uh, list here. Adenocarcinoma, as I mentioned previously, uh, is uh, the main element that changed uh, under histologic types. And uh, as I mentioned, where the previous checklists had been based on the WHO 2004 classification, uh, the most current checklist has been updated to reflect the ISLC ATS ERS revised classification uh, that was released in 2011. Uh, this, classific uh, this classification uh, understanding will also form the basis of the uh, next WHO classification. I'll talk in more detail uh, uh, in a couple of slides uh, about uh, these changes, uh, but just moving on for now through the other histologic types. Uh, large cell carcinoma and subtypes of large cell carcinoma have not changed. There's a squamous carcinoma, squamatoid carcinoma and subtypes, carcinoid tumors, and salivary gland tumors, such as this uh, example of a mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Uh, and these have not changed in the current iteration. Getting back to the changes that have occurred in the adenocarcinoma classification, uh, the types of changes from the 2000, 2004 WHO classification uh, that are reflected in the current CAP checklist can be summarized in uh, three major categories. Probably the most significant of these is the deletion of bronchioloalveolar carcinoma elements, uh, whether mucinous or non-mucinous. 
and replacement of these elements with adenocarcinoma in situ, uh, carcinoma lipidic predominant, and mucinous adenocarcinoma. So typically, pure non-mucinous BAC tumors or previously BAC tumors, and be the occasional mucinous BAC, they are now reclassified as adenocarcinoma in situ if they are less than or equal to three centimeters in diameter, and adenocarcinoma lipidic predominant if they are larger than three centimeters. Mus BACs are kind of a difficult, or previously mucinous BACs are a difficult uh, category, and it's increasingly been recognized that these can be quite aggressive tumors and typically do have some elements of invasion associated with them. Uh, it's a small tumor where the entire tumor has been submitted and, and no invasion can be demonstrated at all in antihistologic sections. Most of these mucinous uh, tumors will be classified as mucinous adenocarcinoma. There has also been a new category that's been created in the uh, 2011 IASLC ATS ERS classification for tumors that are predominantly lipidic uh, but are less than three centimeters in size uh, and demonstrate focal invasion of less than uh, or equal to five millimeters in diameter. And these are reclassified as minimally invasive adenocarcinomas. Just, uh, some pictures of non mucinous and mucinous uh, lipidic growth. Uh, on the left hand side here, you see lipidic growth of these non mucinous uh, neoplastic cells on alveolar receptor surfaces and on the right here, uh, mucinous. Uh, the major category of change uh, to the, uh, from the 2004 WHO classification would be lesion of the adenocarcinoma mixed subtype. I would say I, for one, am not sad to see this subtype go because probably 80% or more of resections for adenocarcinoma would have probably been uh, in this mixed subtype category. Uh, replacing this mixed subtype category, invasive tumors are now to be classified by the predominant histologic subtype. And so there are five uh, different subtypes that are listed here based on predominance of lipidic, acinar, peri, solid, or micropapillary uh, elements. And the micropapillary predominant uh, subtype is, is one that's uh, really new. Just some examples of these different patterns. Uh, we've seen previously lipidic is entirely uh, alveolar septal uh, surface growth, as we see here, and this is uh, sort of a non-mucinous uh, lipidic adenosinoma. Uh, Asner growth is characterized by uh, inflation uh, by these gland-like structures. Pap pattern um, is characterized by the presence of these fibrovascular cores, which are lined on their external surfaces by neoplastic cells. And this is in contrast to the micropapillary pattern, where you get these tufts of cells which are growing and, and have a papillary-like appearance, but without the fibrovascular cores uh, seen uh, in the papillary adenocarcinomas. The distinction is important because it's thought that micropapillary differentiation um, in the micropapillary predominant tumors, but even in tumors where the micropapillary component may be uh, as little as 5 or 10 percent of the histologic subtypes in that tumor, uh, this is a variant that, that uh, seems to be associated with more aggressive behavior and early metastases. And we have uh, the so solid subtype with solid nests of cells which may have uh, mucin vacuoles uh, in them. The major, major category of changes from the WHO 2004 classification of adenocarcinomas would just be a revision of the minor adenocarcinoma variants, specifically a deletion of several uh, minor variants from the 2004 classification, the mucinous adenocarcinoma, which I discussed previously, and enteric adenocarcinomas, fetal adenocarcinomas are retained in the new classification. from histologic type, a histologic grid is now an optional element 
whereas previously it was uh, mandatory. And it made optional simply because there really no good consensus right now as to the best way to grade uh, uh, genomas of, of the lung. <clears throat> uh, the EAP uh, protocol does include some notes which says the grade should be assessed on the worst areas, although this is perhaps somewhat controversial. Uh, some people would argue for uh, being based on the most prevalent areas. A number of different grading schemes have been proposed, and the one that uh, is used as an example in the notes of the CAP protocol is to grade based on the different patterns. So G1, or well-differentiated, being lipidic with G2, or moderately differentiated, being asner and papillary, and G3, uh, for instance, uh, being solid and micropapillary for adenocarcinomas. Uh, G4 is really something that be reserved for undifferentiated tumors, specifically large cell carcinomas, and small cell carcinomas are also, by definition, G4. So invasion is an element that has not changed. Uh, I would reiterate the importance of using elastic staining because any uh, staining uh, to a visceral pleural invasion may sometimes be deceiving. Two dimension fields have not changed in the current iteration. Uh, as in previous uh, iterations, there's a number of different uh, adjacent structures that are listed here, uh, of which may require collaboration with uh, the surgeon or uh, review of the operative note to determine which structures have been invaded. For instance, things like mediastinal invasion or a parietal pleural or chest wall invasion. Uh, sometimes it may not be entirely clear from the specimen itself what structures have been invaded. So the operative note or speaking with a surgeon may be helpful. Martin's uh, the bronchial and parenchymal margin fields have not changed, and, and these are certainly the ones that would be most commonly assessed. Uh, as mentioned previously, the parietal plural and chest wall margin elements have been deleted, and all come under other attached tissue margins. I would that uh, one of the more common queries that we get here at UHN has to do with what we do with peri soft tissue, which may be involved by um, by cells and use this free margin. Uh, that is a difficult and, and maybe somewhat controversial issue, but if it does appear to be truly a, a resection margin, for instance, a mediastinal soft tissue margin, uh, that can be indicated under other attached tissue margin. Other elements uh, having to do with the tumor treatment effects, this has been made more or less optional, uh, this statement required only if applicable has been added. Tumor-associated atelectasis or obstructive pneumonitis may be difficult to assess uh, in logic sections, require correlation with radiology or consultation with uh, the surgeon. Lymph valvular invasion, now this field has changed to include these optional sub-elements when LVI is present. And they're just included to uh, allow indication of what type of lesion is present. Now, sometimes it may be difficult to differentiate lymphatic versus arterial versus venous invasion, but oftentimes it is possible to tell. And uh, those who are inclined to include this information in the synoptic, uh, this is now uh, uh, available. An extra nodal extension from lymph nodes, that has not changed. Moving on to staging elements, uh, nothing really has changed with respect to the staging elements in the checklist. It's still based on the HACC 7th edition. Would to draw your attention in particular to the prefix designators, M for multiple primary tumors. This seems to be something that we're seeing more and more of. I expect maybe because people are getting uh, scanned uh, earlier uh, for lung tumors, so we're starting to see more uh, sort of recessions with multiple tumors. Uh, R for recurrent tumors and Y for post-treatment, be it new adjuvant chemotherapy or radiotherapy. Uh, the elements 
uh, I will not really go into detail. These really have not changed since the last iteration. Uh, Relymph node elements, likewise, uh, have not changed, broken down into N0, N1, N2, and N3 based on uh, of the lymph node stations. And uh, metastatic elements have, haven't changed from uh, last year's uh, list either. I should note that tools within a lobe, uh, if they're considered metastatic, or are not classified under M, but uh, tumor nodes within the same lobe are classified as T3. You have tumor nodules in different ipsilateral lobe that's classified as T4. And only when you have a tumor nodule or metastasis in a contralateral lobe where that is now classified as M1 or M1A. Additional pathologic findings in the checklist have not changed. I mentioned previously the ancillary studies field has changed in that the ability to or anything into that field has now been deleted and replaced with this note that makes reference to the biomarker checklist instead. And there's a field for any other comments that may be inserted. So I'd like to move on to a discussion about biomarkers in lung cancer uh, and uh, about the CAP biomarker, lung biomarker template. Prior to 2004, uh, lung cancer really was considered to be quite simple and divided clinically into two major subcategories, as I mentioned previously, small cell carcinoma and non-small cell carcinoma. So the distinction between the different types of non-small cell carcinoma really wasn't all that crucial. So it often see diagnoses such as non-cell carcinoma not otherwise specified and this was something that really made very little difference to treatment. Over the past decade, however, there's been increasing recognition <clears throat> that there are clinically important differences uh, between different subtypes of non-small cell carcinoma. So in a renewed effort uh, to really try to better subclassify these tumors, and in large part that was uh, the impetus for the new 2011 revised classification of adenocarcinomas uh, of the lung. That's because treatments may potentially differ for different types of non-small cell lung cancer. For example, there's been recognition in recent years treatment of patients with squamous cell carcinoma, uh, bacisumab, which is a VEGF inhibitor, actually result in life-threatening hemorrhage uh, and in patients with squamous cell carcinoma. An example of this uh, is the differential efficacy of pemetrexed as a chemotherapeutic agent in adenocarcinoma versus squamous cell carcinoma. So you can see in the figure here that uh, in the blue here, we've got the survival curve with uh, pemetrexed and cisplatinum versus uh, pemetra uh, sorry, cisplatinum and gemcitabine. In adenocarcinoma, there is slightly better survival in patients treated with pemetrexed uh, compared to uh, the other chemotherapy, and the actually the reverse in squamous cell carcinoma. More importantly, however, uh, over the past decade there's been growing recognition of specific molecular alterations that may confer sensitivity to specific targeted therapies. Alterations may be associated with specific histologic subtypes. In particular, uh, adenocarcinomas of the lung have been associated with EGFR mutations and ALK gene rearrangements, and we'll discuss these in, in more detail. But look at this pie chart uh, of molecular alterations in pulmonary adenocarcinoma. You can see that approximately half of uh, pulmonary adenocarcinomas have some sort of driver mutation. Um, and many of these are amenable to target therapies. So the <clears throat> two landmark studies that really set this all in motion in 2004, one published in the journal Science and one 
published in the New England Journal. These both had to do with <clears throat> activating mutations of the EGFR gene in lung cancer and showing that these correlated with clinical response to small molecule tyrosine kinase inhibitors of EGFR. Now, EGFR stands for epidermal growth receptor. The membrane tyrosine kinase receptor that's involved in activating several major pathways involved in tumor biology. Being mutations in the tyrosine kinase domain of the EGFR gene uh, have been associated with sensitivity to these molecule tyrosine kinase inhibitors, uh, such as gefitinib, erbinib, and most recently afatinib, as an additional inhibitor that's been just recently approved for clinical use. While they're activating mutations in EGFR, however, other mutations in the gene may actually confer resistance to these uh, testing kinase inhibitors. EGFR mutations are most often found in adenocarcinomas. There are EGFR gene alterations within squamous cell carcinomas. Uh, these tend to be different from the ones in, in adenocarcinomas, but it's really a small proportion of those tumors. These are more prevalent in East Asian populations than in Caucasian populations, and in females and males, and typically occur in smokers or light smokers, uh, and infrequently in smokers. Just looking at a schematic representation of the EGFR uh, gene, there's a few EGFR binding domains that are extracellular, uh, but I would draw attention in particular to the tyrosine kinase. Uh, domain, uh, specifically exon, which is in, in exons 18 to 21. And most of the important mutations in the EGFR gene that uh, confer either sensitivity or resistance to uh, kinase inhibitors uh, occur within these four exons. Now, mutations may be associated either with resistance to the drugs or with sensitivity. Uh, of Mutations that are associated with sensitivity to tyrosine kinase inhibitors, most frequent would be small lesions within exon 19 and a point mutation resulting in a substitution L858R within exon 21. And these two uh, categories of mutations together would account for approximately 90% of activating mutations. There are also a number of other uh, frequent activating mutations in exon 19, rare ones also in exon 20. Intermutations are associated with drug resistance. Uh, the most common of these would be the T790M uh, point mutation in exon 20. And this is the mutation that is most commonly associated with acquired resistance against these uh, EGFR uh, molecule inhibitors. There are also a number of insertions with on 20 that can result in resistance. So the, the, the discovery of uh, EGFR mutations and the role in lung cancer was uh, exciting was because treatment of patients with these mutations really does uh, imp improve survival when they're treated with these uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Simple studies here showing overall uh, survival in patients treated with these EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and see that the survival rate in patients who have mutation is much better than in patients uh, that, that do not harbor these mutations. And similarly, uh, the survival curve in patients who harbor the mutation here versus wild type EGFR in, in this curve. In 2009, the results of the bypass study were. Uh, published in the New England Journal, and these really no evidence for use of EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors as first-line treatments for patients with advanced non-cell lung cancer with EGFR mutations. <clears throat> Looking at the curve on the left, left-hand side here, these patients uh, may have EGFR activating mutations treat with first-line gefitinib versus chemotherapy, you can see progression-free survival in these patients was quite improved 
compared to first-line treatment with conventional chemotherapy. Interestingly enough, if patients did not have an EGFR mutation, treatment with uh, first-line treatment with tyrosine kinase inhibitor was actually inferior to uh, treatment with conventional chemotherapy. It's really the importance of testing for the presence of, of these mutations uh, in order to select for the appropriate therapy. In terms of testing for EGFR mutations, there's a whole number of different methods that are uh, uh, these days uh, for the presence of uh, these mutations molecularly. There's a number of pre political con uh, considerations before we actually get into the testing itself, which may be important just because of the impact that they have on the suitability of specimens for testing. Uh, some of these include fixative type, uh, specifically fixatives that, that may include heavy metal ions may actually inhibit some of the uh, polymerase chain reaction uh, that are uh, needed for this testing. Uh, thankfully, most fixatives uh, don't contain these, uh, but that may be consideration. Duration uh, time may also be a factor that impacts on success of testing. Uh, specifically, uh, extended fixation times may result in excessive cross-linking of DNA, which may uh, decrease the uh, amplification efficiency uh, for this testing. Experience decalcification is something that actually may degrade the DNA to a, to a degree that it's no longer suitable for testing. Uh, approximately maybe 50% of our cases that have been decalcified uh, are really suitable for testing or the, or the testing fails. Best size and tumor cellularity are also important because these just determine the amount of DNA uh, that's available for testing. Um, tumor cellularity in particular, um, as a percentage of all cells that are present in the specimen, realizing that in any tumor samples there, there may be inflammatory cells or stromal cells or types of cells mixed in there. And the each that's required for success testing will depend to a degree on the type of testing or, or the method used for testing. I'll talk about that in a minute. Now, contrary to what it seems uh, like a, a common misperception, uh, seems to be that surgical pathology and, uh, or sorry, cytology specimens may be used for each part testing. Uh, actually, both surgical pathology and cytologic specimens may be suitable for testing depending on how they've been processed. Now, the recent uh, CAP, IASLC, AMP guidelines that were uh, released just last year said that all mutations comprising uh, greater than or equal to 1% of known EGFR mutations should be tested. If the methods used for testing, the gold standard is still direct DNA sequencing uh, using Sanger-based technologies. The main fact of this approach, however, is that it really does require maybe up to 50% tumor cellularity for reliable detection of these mutations. And as uh, no doubt you've all experienced, there are going to be many tumors where the uh, per tumor cells is really going to be much lower than that 50% threshold. As a result, there's been a whole host of different molecular methods that have been developed for testing. Um, these with uh, significant higher sensitivity than uh, Sanger DNA sequencing. And uh, the 2013 guidelines for each of our and ELK testing really don't specify which of these should be used, only that whichever method your lab decides to use, it needs to undergo proper validation. Quick note about mutation-specific antibodies for immune histochemistry. Uh, this has been advocated by some, uh, but experience seems to be that these uh, anti-EGFR antibodies, the mutation-specific, while they may actually have high specificity, uh, their sensitivity is too low to put their use as a standalone test for selecting tyrosine kinase inhibitor therapy. That said, there are some who advocate uh, using immunohistochemistry as a screen so that if the result is positive, 
uh, no molecular testing is required. The result is negative. Those cases would then uh, require molecular testing. Uh, moving on to ELK, uh, rearrangements of the ELK gene, anaplastic lymphoma kinase, have been described in about 5% of pulmonary adenocarcinomas, uh, typically uh, in association with solid or cribriform logic type or with signet ring morphology. Uh, these are typically TTF1 positive tumors. Often the re rearrangement involves translocations with the EML4 gene, or more recently a number of other translocation partners have been identified. Uh, EGFR mutations, these are typically found in non-smokers or light smokers. The reason ELK rearrangements have become important in recent years is that tumors with ELK gene rearrangements are associated with response to chrysotinib. Just to show uh, some data from a 2010 paper describing this in the New England Journal, uh, this was a study of patients with tumors that had the ELK arrangement who were treated with chrysotinib. And on the left side here, you can see the waterfall plot showing the gin tumor size from baseline with treatment. And if you use 30% uh, decrease in tumor size as criteria for response. All there was a response rate of 57%, including some uh, complete or near complete uh, responses in this patient group. So really, this was quite uh, exciting uh, finding. And in the bottom here, you can see coronal view of uh, CT scans. Before chrysotinib, uh, kind of really significant tumor on the light here, and then after treatment. Uh, that tumor is, is almost completely gone. The gold standard for testing for ELK rearrangements in lung cancer is uh, for us in situ hybridization. You know, break apart probe with a label on the five prime end and, and red label on the three prime end. Similarly, if there's no rearrangement, these two signals should overlap and they should give you two yellow signals within a nucleus. But in the presence of a, a rearrangement, uh, the two probes are separated, and you'll see a distinct green and a distinct red signal, or in some cases you may see loss of one or the other signal. Uh, there is actually immunohistochemical uh, testing for ELK rearranged uh, tumors, and using uh, either the A4 or D5 F3 monoclonal antibody using protocols that are optimized to detect a rearrangement. And these antibodies, when properly optimized, will give uh, good cytoplasmic staining of the tumor cells uh, in the presence of this rearrangement. In our experience, uh, uh, properly optimized, this is really quite uh, thick and sensitive. And in our hands, it's, it's useful as a screen, uh, such that negative cases do not, not prove fish and uh, positive or equivocal cases uh, then proceed fish for confirmation. Word of KRAS mutations. Uh, KRAS is a member of the RAS family of oncogenes, and these are uh, GTPAs, a function in number of cell signaling pathways. Uh, KRAS mutations are the most common oncogene molecular alteration in pulmonary adenocarcinomas. They typically occur in smokers, often in association with mucinous morphology, and typically mutually exclusive uh, with either EGFR mutations or ALK rearrangements. Um, there's some data as to whether KRAS mutations are associated with relative resistance to uh, EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors, but given that they tend, the mutations tend to be mutually exclusive with EGFR mutations, that a lot of these patients with KRAS mutations will not respond to those treatments. So we'd like to move on to look at the own biomarker template. Uh, version 1.1, 1 .1, uh, I guess it was early released in, uh, in 2013, and posted uh, in, in October of last year. 
So the biomarker template starts with a field for describing specimen adequacy, and this can be adequate or suboptimal. And under adequate, there's a field for estimating the tumor cellularity as a percentage of uh, total cells. And really, just to, to really for some of the um, the analytical considerations that I was mentioning previously, things like fixation, tumor cellularity, which may render uh, a specimen suboptimal. I should note that if you're working with a specimen that is suboptimal, a failure to detect something like an EGFR mutation in that setting may best be reported as indeterminate or an inter indeterminate result rather than a negative result. A uh, common situation in, this, in which this may occur is when we have a very low cellularity specimen where the tumor cellularity may be less than 5% of total cellularity, um, but that the sensitivity or the uh, sensitivity of detection for our test method is uh, between 1% to 5%. If the tumor cellularity is less than 5%, we elect to do the test on the chance that we do detect a mutation, in which case we would call it positive. But if no mutation is detected, we cannot be sure whether it's because it's negative or because the tumor cellularity was below the detection limits. So in a situation like that, we would label the specimen as being suboptimal and report that as an indeterminate result rather than as a negative result. Moving on, the results section in the biomarker template starts off with EGFR mutation analysis, either mutations uh, detected or mutations detected with a list uh, that can be uh, checked. And I've highlighted in green here the mutations that are associated with uh, response to tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and in red, the ones that are associated with resistance to those same inhibitors. Alk arrangements, uh, the field is also provided here. Uh, there is a field for polysomy. Um, oftentimes, with Alk fish results, there may be a polysomy of a chromosome or polysomies in, involving the Alk locus. So, they show up as multiple signals, uh, three or more signals within, the, uh, within each nucleus. Uh, the significance of this polysomy really isn't at, at this point, but it's not thought that polysomy predicts response to crizotinib. At this point, it's thought that really only ALK rearrangements predict response. So whereas polysomy may be something that you note and that you may note in this checklist, it does not appear to predict uh, clinical response to crizotinib. Uh, Monte K RAS, uh, Again, no mutation versus mutation identified. And you can see that the bulk of the mutations in the KRAS gene are mutations either at codon 12 or codon 13. Um, in, uh, in this entry here is a rider at the bottom which says that no specific tyrosine kinase inhibitors have been approved for lung adenocarcinomas with KRAS mutations. Also, it that KRAS mutations are typically mutually exclusive of EGFR. ALK alterations. And that's a space for other markers which um, will grow in coming years. There's a whole number of different molecular markers that are currently being investigated for potential relevance to lung cancer and potential targeted therapies, including ROS1, which may show some relevance to crizotinib, RASMET, PIK3CA, and uh, BRAF. And there's a whole host of others uh, as well. well the test also does include sections for the different methodologies. So on EGFR, uh, indicating which exons are tested, and indicating the uh, mutation analysis method. As I mentioned, direct Sanger sequencing is the gold standard, but there are a number of uh, other methods that are coming or incoming, including pyro sequencing, next generation sequencing and various other uh, hybridation or melting point types of analyses. Uh, it is somewhat important to know the performance characteristics of the tests that you're using because test sensitivity will vary 
by method. And I mean, the percentage of tumor cellularity may range from 1% to 10 or 20% required uh, depending on the method that's used. Uh, Simulates are there for ALK and, and KRAS alterations. Uh, so uh, for ALK, there's a, a field for or, or uh, transcriptase PCR is, is actually not, not a method that's uh, recommended for ALK testing. But immunohistochemistry um, as a screen method uh, is something that's uh, potentially quite useful. Similarly, uh, the KRAS fields look a lot like the EGFR field. Uh, just in terms of uh, wing mutations are assessed and uh, the method. Finally, there's uh, space for other testing methods for other markers. Um, so I just mentioned that you know, new methods are emerging all the time, and particularly exciting are uh, multiplex methods that allow testing hundreds of alterations simultaneously. I'm hoping that future iterations of, of the CAP biomarker template won't have hundreds of different uh, genes to, to mark, but uh, certainly this is something that will, um, I guess, evolve over time. And these methods may include mass spectrometry-based methods or next-generation sequencing. And find space here in the biomarker template for any comments that you may have. For instance, if you want to indicate the fixative type that was used or time of fixation, um, or anything else that may be uh, relevant to uh, the success or failure of the testing. So I have reviewed the CAP lung cancer uh, protocol, uh, focusing on areas of change, and in particular the changes to the classification of adenocarcinoma uh, away from the WHO 2004 classification to the 2011 revised classification. I've briefly overviewed some of the targetable molecular alterations in lung cancer, um, focused on EGFR mutations and ALK gene rearrangements, and finally have reviewed the CAP lung marker checklist. So just thanks to Dr. Nchao, who provided some of the slides for this talk, as well as uh, Dr. Suzanne Camel reed and Dr. Ken Kradick, uh, who provided some of the pictures. Okay, prepared to take questions. Uh, thanks, uh, David. So, um, if uh, have any questions being submitted, uh, the CCO software there, uh, please um, do it by the timing that they were submitted. So, no questions yet. Uh, so, um, we'll just uh, wait a minute. Uh, this is a question. Um, not sure from who, but it says who is eligible for molecular testing? And just you could say what, where, where you're from, and um, uh, but that would be great. Um, okay, thanks. Uh, eligible eligibility for molecular testing. Testing is, is a bit of a moving target, and to some degree may depend on what uh, province uh, you're living in. <clears throat> Recently, I, I think it's standard of care to perform a GFR mutation testing on patients with advanced non-squamous, non-small cell carcinoma. I guess over the past, uh, I think, maybe three years now, there's been the EGFR Canada program. Uh, which has been running across the country, and uh, this uh, does provide for um, testing of GFR mutations in patients with advanced cancers. Uh, I believe recently uh, AstraZeneca, uh, which has been funding that program, uh, opened it up to uh, permit reflux testing. Uh, funding of that program is set to expire uh, later this year, it remains to be seen what the different uh, provincial bodies uh, who probably would be picking up funding for that testing. <clears throat> it remains to be seen what, what the criteria will be. Uh, I would suspect that at a minimum, uh, 
testing would be permitted for patients with advanced stage uh, lung cancer, so stage four, uh, because EGFR uh, kinase inhibitors are first-line therapy in that setting. Um, but uh, at this point, it, it's a little bit unclear. Uh, for ALK testing, um, that's one area that, that uh, is also, I think, quite heterogeneous across different jurisdictions. Uh, in Ontario, uh, ALK testing is funded for patients with cancer, but uh, it's not at this time, I, I think, uh, funded as, as a reflux, uh, reflex test. Great. Thanks very much. Uh, next question is from uh, Kathy Strutker at um, St. Michael's Hospital. And uh, it says, you mentioned overfixation is bad. What is cutoff time for this? Also, is underfixation a problem? Yeah, thank you question. Um, um, I'm sure if hard and fast cutoffs, um, I think if, if the two has been in formalin for two or three weeks, um, chances are it's, it's going to be overfixed. Now, that, that having been said, it would still be worthwhile uh, submitting it for testing just to see if it uh, if it's, um, in terms of underfixation. Well, I mean, do thing on fresh tissue. I mean, as long as it's not underfixed and has been degrading over time as a result of that. Um, that uh, may be less of an issue, I, I think. Thanks. Uh, this one comes from Samantha Spencer. Um, regarding ROS1, she said, we have been told by the lung marker authors that this is authors, that this plan to be included in the next iteration of the template in spring uh, 2015. Um, yeah, I, I think that may be possible. Uh, and, and thank you, by the way. Um, Ros has been associated with uh, some response to crotonib. Uh, at present, I don't think there's any labs in Canada that are uh, performing this on on a routine basis. And uh, the oncologists here have been sitting down to a private lab in, in the U.S. for patients who have requested that testing. Um, what's going to be included in the next iteration or not, I, I can't comment because I'm not, uh, haven't been to that group. Thanks. The next one is from Amir Samani in Brampton. Um, do you use elastic stain for papillary carcinoma versus BAC? Uh, he says, Dr. S had a recent publication about it. Papillary cancer is elastic negative, but <clears throat> BAC has elastic and subalveolar space. Yeah, thank that question. And that's uh, a tricky question, and, and certainly the differentiation between papillary adenocarcinomas and uh, BACs in emphysema lung tissue can be a very difficult distinction, and it's one that we certainly do struggle with from time to time here. I, I mean, that's uh, we we do electrochrome stains uh, routine. On all of our resection specimens, so so that is one of the things that that we might use in making that uh, differentiation. Uh, sometimes what may make it a little bit difficult is is there may actually be some fibroelastosis uh, associated with tumors just as a reaction. So uh, I wouldn't say necessarily uh, kind of hundred percent. Um, you know, the things we we find helpful once in a while is just doing keratin stains, um, just see whether there appears to be an infiltrative pattern or, or whether it's more regular. But uh, certainly that's, that's a difficult question. I just have a clarification from Samantha Spencer. She said that um, she, she didn't identify herself, but she's CAP staff, and that that was an FYI from the authors on the committee, and that's what they've told her. So that was mostly just an FYI. Oh, wonderful. The Ross you. one. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay, the, uh, the next question is from Barbara. It's, she asks, does microsection of tumor from the paraffin have a place in increasing sensitivity? Uh, I'm sorry, I missed the first part of that question. It's, does my, my section of tumor from the paraffin have a 
place in increasing sensitivity? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm not aware if there's any centers uh, in Canada that are performing microdissection. Uh, only at, at our um, center, we are sort of macro dissecting people off, off the slide, and uh, in terms that that does seem to improve the sensitivity. And that's a particular case, um, say in a small biopsy specimen, where you may have pieces of totally benign bronchial tissue as one piece of tissue uh, containing two cells. Uh, in patients like that, that, we would mark the, uh, the fragments or the areas on the slide that could tumor and try to in enrich the tumor cellularity that, wa that way. And uh, that, that seems to work pretty well in our lab here. Great, thanks. I have another question from Amir Samani. He asks, um, do you agree with the statement in the archives 2012? When diagnosis of squamous cell carcinoma is made on a small biopsy sample, especially in a never smoker patient, the pathologist should question the possibility of adenosquamous cell carcinoma, and these tumors should be tested for EGFR slash KRAS mutations. Uh, thank you. Uh, we, we do uh, tend to agree with that statement. Uh, we have seen adenosquamous carcinomas that have tested positive for EGFR mutation. In a small biopsy, and especially with that kind of history of you know, non-smoker, uh, it's, it's a little bit unusual. So we would tend to give the patient the, the benefit of the doubt in that situation. Um, now, I don't know that I've ever, I, I don't remember sort of in two or three years ever having seen a positive EGFR mission case in the situation, but I, I think at least for the patients and maybe the oncologist's peace of mind, uh, that yes, we would give the patient the benefit of the doubt and test that. That having said, uh, oftentimes when we do receive specimens of testing, there is no clinical history provided. So oftentimes we'll reject the specimen because it's squamous cell carcinoma and then subsequently get information that this was a non-smoker, could you please test it? So it would be helpful if uh, uh, people could provide sort of information uh, up front if it is a squamous cell carcinoma. Oh, great. I have another question from uh, Barbara. You mentioned one to ten percent, one to ten percent cellularity as a ballpark figure. Are biopsies with over percent cellularity of tumor suitable? Thank you. Um, it really depends on the type of method that's being used. I mean, fifteen percent cellularity would be more than adequate uh, for the type of methods we use. The sensitivity for detection is in the one to five percent range, um, but it wouldn't be suitable, for instance, if if your lab uses uh, Sanger uh, direct sequencing, which would require fifty percent. Most of the molecular methods these days um, be sort of maybe in the fifteen or twenty percent range uh, in terms of sensitivity. So you just need to know what that cut cutoff is uh, for your lab and then make your determination based on that. Uh, thanks. The next question is from Anna Plotkin, uh, Trillium Health Partnership in Mississauga. Who should initiate the biomarker testing, pathologists or clinicians, on cores or resection speci specimens? Thank you. Uh, that may be a little bit of controversy right now. Um, I think ideally, um, it should be the pathologist who initiates the testing uh, at the time of diagnosis. That, that would be simplest in terms of workflow. Um, present, I, I don't think that's necessarily feasible uh, just because of funding situations. I mean, if, if the province will not fund uh, reflasting and if they only fund um, testing on advanced stage lung cancers, it's not always apparent to the pathologist what the clinical stage is, especially if it's just a, a core biopsy. On occasion, it, it may be. So if there's an adrenal mass that's been biopsied and that is a pulmonary adenocarcinoma, then I think it would be appropriate for the pathologist right away to initiate testing 
to prevent uh, sort of further delays in the road. But um, I guess the short answer is, is the jury is, is out on that one. Uh, I think Ely should be the pathologist that initiates, uh, but I think in, in a lot of jurisdictions, <clears throat> just because of the fine issues, uh, it really to the medical oncologists who primarily initiate the testing. In terms of the uh, type of specimen you use, whether cores or rictions, um, again, depending on the testing type, um, it probably doesn't much matter to have both probably be better to send the resection specimens, but you only have a core biopsy or if you only have a stock from a pleural fluid or, or from FNA, uh, certainly those can be sent as well. Um, yeah, that answers the question. So David, it's still here. Um, what we've done here at Grand River is um, we sort of do it reflexively, especially if it's an adeno CA. Um, you know, our testing site, we're a thoracic surgery site at St. Mary's, but obviously we don't do any of the biomarker testing. Mm -hmm. And um, so the one thing is, um, you know, we had uh, the folks who are doing the testing come over and actually get some quality, you know, expectation that they want specimen adequacy, et cetera, so we know what to send, and uh, we sort of do it reflexively. We've also got the eBus, and if it's an adeno CA, we, we automatically send it off uh, for ALK and EGFR, um, and because uh, we're finding, you know, the pathologists were ordering it, the oncologists, the surgeons, and it was, just became, uh, you know, very, very inefficient. So uh, it's working very well for us um, doing it uh, at the time of the biopsy or the FNA or the eBus. Yeah, I think that would be the ideal uh, situation. Um, at present, that is possible, I think, in large measure, b because the EGFR Canada program uh, started funding, uh, as far as I'm aware, has started funding reflex testing. Um, that funding expires later this year and is taken over, presumably, by different provincial jurisdictions. Um, still an open question whether we'll be able to continue uh, flex testing in that way because you know, the Ministry of Health refuses to uh, that kind of testing and own funds on advanced cancer cases. I mean, those costs may need to be recouped from you know the rating departments, and uh, that that may actually put a damper on that. So uh, at the point, I'm, I'm not sure beyond this year what's uh, what's going to happen, but certainly I would agree reflex testing is, is really ideal. We've got a question um, from uh, Barbara. On a biopsy of poorly differentiated carcinoma, do you accept TTF1 and P63 as definite evidence of differentiation? Hmm. So that's, uh, thank you. Uh, that, that's a very controversial question in, in some quarters, and apparently subject of some fairly lively discussion um, among the group that was uh, is preparing the next uh, WHO classification as to where kind of an other, other undifferentiated tumor with TTF positivity should be definitely classified as adenocarcinoma or with P63 positive TTF negative definitively as squamous cell carcinoma. I, I think there probably is some molecular evidence to suggest that that's the case, but uh, I think consensus out there was that uh, the jury is still out on that, and uh, I believe that the next iteration of the WHO classification will, will probably accept that, but will probably include uh, um, include a category for sort of a non-small cell carcinoma with adenocarcinoma phenotype or with squamous cell carcinoma phenotype. I'm not exactly sure where everything has landed in that regard, but I don't think it'll be bit of adeno or definitive squame. I think there will be kind of a middle ground category. Okay, related to that, um, Alison from London, she asked, do you recommend using P40 versus P63 for determining squamous differentiation? 
Yeah, thank you. Um, we, I'm a bit embarrassed to say we, we don't actually have P40 in our lab. I mean, it's being worked up. The thing that I've read, um, yes, I, I think that would be preferable. Uh, you know P63 can give, give uh, a fair amount of non-specific staining, even in fairly well-differentiated uh, adenochromas. So that can uh, really confound uh, the assessment at times. Uh, we're actually working towards uh, replacing our P63 with P40 here. Um, oh, one other question. Um, this is from Rula Alpadine. When it is positive by AHC and waiting fish, is it urgent to call the oncologist to begin treatment um, at the earliest possible time? Yeah, thank you. Um, that would typically be our practice here, uh, just because it may take two or three weeks. And um, I'm not sure what the procedure is uh, for funding of crizotinib here, whether it requires fish confirmation or not. Um, but if nothing else, that would, uh, I guess, enable the oncologist to uh, bring the patient back in and get things arranged. Uh, for the drug start as soon as the fish confirmation is, is there. So uh, that would be our typical practice here to uh, the, uh, the oncologist either a note or give them a call. Thanks. Um, uh, we're, I think we've come to the end of the questions. Um, um, I've just got one uh, comment to make. Uh, one of the things we are looking at at CCO is um, because the biomarker testing is being centralized, and, and I think the lung one, you know, the new biomarker template is really nice because the biomarker testing is really centralized, um, you know, with parts of it not being done in multiple hospitals. Uh, but CCO, um, as, we, as, as the institutions implement the biomarkers, what we're trying to do is make sure that for example, if UHN, um, you know, releases their biomarker template, uh, when it gets to CCO, um, it's, it's done in a way that it actually gets connected with the originating biopsy or lung resection, just so that from a CCO database perspective, um, you know, we, we can make sure that the patient's uh, data is sort of uh, connected. So that's what we're looking at. And, and the breast biomarker one where it, it kind of multiple an important thing to look at uh, with that separation of the biomarker report to make sure, at least from a cancer registry perspective, uh, that it you know, ties in with the originating um, hospital and specimen checklist report. Thank you. I guess um, if there are any questions? Nope. No, okay. no more questions. Do you want a minute or so, or shall we? Uh, we? We should. We probably wrap it up. Okay. So, um, on behalf of Cancer Care on and the Canadian for I would like to thank Dr. Wang for a very good presentation today. I want to thank uh, all the staff uh, for uh, making all the arrangements and the and the technical uh, arrangements uh, for this uh, to happen. So this is the first session of the 20th series of the uh, CAP checklist presentations, and we welcome your comments and suggestions for ways to ensure these sessions are to your practice. Please do your feedback and suggestions as part of your uh, completed online uh, evaluations. Web extra recording of this presentation becomes available. It will be uh, made available for wide distribution via links posted by Cancer Care Ontario, CAC, and the Canadian Association of pathologists. This recording will be available for review at your convenience and is not restricted. As a reminder, both the live and recorded presentations are eligible for recording uh, education credits. Please see the session notice uh, for that information. Um, again, note the GME certificate for each of the CAP checklist education sessions for one month after the presentation date. The sessions will remain available electronically for an undetermined period of time, but these certificates will only be issued for one month. 
again, please refer to the session notice for uh, the exact details and deadlines and dates. And uh, please just remember um, our schedule. Uh, the next one is Head and Neck, and that's on February the 20th, and that will be uh, Dr. Martin Ballard. So again, uh, Dr. David Hwang, thank you very, very much. Thank you.